is in the audience, and that's those are the alternates that are in the audience. Okay. Uh, any changes to the agenda? No. Okay. Uh, public items, a, a chance for the public to make some comments, not on the agenda? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Mulhart. My name is Peter Goldenring. Uh, I'm an attorney. I represent R&R &R Recycling and Rusty Cochran. We had expected to be on the agenda, uh, but learned uh, recently from your staff that the matter had been shifted off agenda and into executive session uh, to follow the public session. So uh, I wanted to take the opportunity, one, to introduce myself, two, to let you know that I provided to each of you a memorandum that addresses the issues that we think uh, are existing. The R&R &R recycling is a recycling project that the planning department is prepared to issue a negative mitigated declaration on and allow to proceed. Uh, staff at GMA has placed a hold on that because of a dispute with state ready mix concerning the amount of historical base allocation. And I'm not a water attorney. If I use the wrong words, please forgive me. John Matthews is water counsel for us. Uh, and uh, er, and taken the position, as we understand that there's a CEQA issue, uh, and we respectfully have advised them we think not, and we think county counsel for RMA likewise. Mr. Kwong has uh, said not. Uh, recently, Jeff Pratt became involved, and he's been very constructive in some of the discussions that are, are undergoing, and we understand that there are some policy issues that you need to deal with, including the issue of what is the historical allocation for the state ready mix well. Uh, we've provided you a declaration from Mr. Preston on what he understood the under arrangements to be. Uh, the second issue we understand is the transfer of certain water allocation rights from Rail Manor. We obtained a water transfer agreement in that regard. And there's been some discussion between us and Mr. Pratt on that in that regard. The issue is the linking by GMA staff of the state ready mix well allocation issue with the R and R recycling project. The planning department has identified that project as an independent standalone project and is prepared to proceed after a very long time in terms of us moving forward. And what we have suggested to staff is that they cannot legally take the position they have, but as a practical matter, the two acre feet or less that R&R &R will use will come from the state ready mix well and it will either affect whatever the state ready mix operation has and may result in greater overcharges that have to be paid depending on what that allocation ultimately is determined or it may be affected by a water transfer agreement once those issues are worked out but whatever it is the R&R &R project can on the lease put in its own well and extract the two acre feet it's just a function of how much and so we would urge when you consider this matter in closed session that the R&R &R project be delinked so that the planning side can move forward and then at that point we have tasked Mr. Matthews to work closely with staff to solve the historical state ready mix water well allocation issue, the real manner transfer agreement, whether that needs to change or not change, to solve that issue because that becomes a how much issue really in terms of what has to be paid. So I just wanted to put those issues on the table, thank Mr. Pratt for his recent involvement uh, and comments and, and ask that you please review the memorandum. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, anybody else have public comments? <coughs> Items not on the agenda? Okay, uh, board member comments? Anybody? Yeah. The only comment I have is I'd like to congratulate Miranda for being back. This is your first child, number one, boy, girl, and he's already in college and he's out the door. I don't know how you did it, uh, but you yeah, just took care of it. Congratulations. All right. Anybody else? Any comments? Okay. Um, we have some consent items. Two uh, consent items. Um, motion to approve the consent items. So move. Chair, would I uh, like to suggest that maybe we remove the uh, budget discussion from the consent item agenda? And I think there's some issues I have some questions on. 
Okay. Well, let's do it. Well, let's just do it uh, in sequence then. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes? I'll withdraw my previous motion and make a motion to approve the minutes of the previous meeting. Okay. That's a motion. Uh, I'll second the motion if I can ask that. Um, it seemed to me the spirit of um, uh, Mr. Gromlich's uh, comments with regard to the zone application didn't. Uh, well, it's, it's factual, uh, the spirit of what the intent of the use of the credit transfers was. Uh, Zone's position is try to ass help solve assaults remediation. If we can't continue to do that, then we'll have to pull backwards and just use 100% Fox Canyon. I don't think that's really in the benefit okay. of the basin. And that's what Mr. Grama commented on. But that didn't leak its way into the minutes. Okay. Why don't we do this, <laughs> if with your permission? Let me withdraw. Have you withdraw the consent of the approval of minutes? Let's roll it to next month. And if you want to check with staff and make the minutes read the way you think they ought to read, then bring it back to us. Let's do well, it that way. They need to read the way it was said. Okay. Not, whatever. Not yeah. what I think. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Whatever. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But let's just adjust the meetings, the minutes. It's very seldom that we have changes to the minutes, so you've made a, a comment. Let's uh, deal with it. So, I'll withdraw my motion. Okay. So the motion is withdrawn. You put the second in, so I assume the second is withdrawn. Withdrawn second. Okay. So no minutes are approved. Item one is not approved. Let's go to item number two. <laughs> Gerard. I'm ready to answer any questions, or we do have a short presentation, whichever you'd like. Um, let's do a short presentation. Uh, is, okay, let's do a short presentation, please. And you had sent us some. Oh, okay, we're going to get them here. Here we go. Did you do it? Yeah, it's right here. Okay, have that back. Right. Oh, okay, okay. All right. right. They look the same because the same colors. We didn't know whether you were you were going to ask for it, so we're just ready. Okay. The years of being a Boy Scout leader pay off. There you go. <clears throat> okay. But we didn't get the oversized package. Yeah. Essentially, the uh, meat of the discussion was, took place at the study session, so today we're here to confirm your direction as we understood it which was uh, important, but very few things uh, were, were policy issues as we understood it, and then just bring it back to you ready for adoption as proposed. We'll be happy to answer any questions. As you know, uh, the core, the, the bulk of our costs and our work are reflected in the uh, work plan, the annual work plan, both the level of effort and the folks involved, and a labor costing in terms of hours. Uh, to the left, we have our core one, ta section one core tasks, which are, are essentially what we have to do in order to conform to uh, regulations, the statute, and business practice and requirements, and the others are the additional work tasks which your board evaluates whether it wants or not. The uh, four tasks highlighted in italic type, non-reporting, groundwater basin adoption, boundary adoption, strategic public outreach, and ground groundwater supply enhancement assistant program, GSAP, our new programmatic initiatives which your board reviewed and directed us to include in the final budget which we have. Essentially, this table just reports that information in a slightly different way in terms of the Section 1 core tasks. Uh, there are 24 discrete tasks, totaling an estimate of 4,238 hours, uh, which translate to just a little bit over two and a quarter FTEs for that level of cost. Uh, with respect, then, to the 13 additional work tasks, Nine of those, as they're listed, are either continuations or revisions uh, on those tasks that were initially shown in the 0809 work plan and 09010, their legacy issue resolutions. Uh, and you see the rough level of our effort there at 1,712 hours or just shy of a full FTE at the cost identified. Uh, the new task initiatives are shown the last four and comparable uh, levels of effort and cost. So the 13 tasks total about 2,352 hours or just over one and a quarter FPEs at the cost. And these were all uh, consistent with the policy direction that your board gave us at the meeting. This is just another way to show um, in terms of our cores what we, what we were going to do or will do at the year end. Uh, we still don't have precise complete numbers yet because there's one report to come in, but this is pretty close. And, uh, and the pie chart on the left or on the right is what's proposed in terms of the work plan for the core cost next year. Similarly, when we add in the additional work tasks on the left, this is what it's like for this year, or just over 50 percent 
of our level of effort were on the additional tasks this year, whereas proposed in the plan next year as a distribution. Now, of course, these are plans, and actual uh, uh, reporting over the quarter will verify how we, how we do in 10-11. Um, the major budget adjust adjustments for the non-work plan portion was we recommended to your board using increased surcharge revenues available to fully fund GEMS up to the 500000 target. Your board told us include that in the final budget. We did. Uh, we recommended that uh, we seed the GSAP program with 250000 in seed money. Your board told us increase that to 500000 again, from the available revenues, surcharge, and others. We did. Uh, and the, there's really, it's not an augmentation, but the standard reserve designation of 100000 for above the bottom line contingency. So those were really the three major cost issues beyond the work plan that are in the <coughs> final budget. Um, this is just the taking that information and rolling up in a source of use. Our starting balance uh, projected at June 30th is just a little over $2.3 million. Um, we confirmed with your board the operating assumptions on pump charge payments, interest earnings, and surcharge revenues. You see them listed. So it's projected to have just over, just under 3.8 million in financing resources available next year. And then the costs, as you see, the core costs of the work plan, the additional costs, uh, the non-labor cost estimates, including the GSAP and the one-time budget contribution to GEMS, the designation. So about 1.8 million in expenditure requirements, which would leave us a projected year-end fund balance next year of just a little under 2 million, 1.9 million, as, in, as indicated. And if the budget's adopted as proposed, and if it uh, comes to pass as planned, uh, that 1.9 million <coughs> number will be distributed in these components next year. Um, so that's pretty much where we have. It seems like you, you gave us fairly definitive policy direction at the last meeting, and it's just uh, bringing that back for final adoption. I'd be happy to answer any other questions you might have. Okay. Any members? Any questions? Uh, a few questions just that I had when I'm researching. By the way, this is very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, under... Section 1, Agency Core Tasks, Technical Services, Groundwater and Water Well Project Reviews. It says here we're conducting CEQA IS project reviews for an estimated three large groundwater projects. What are those? I believe, let me grab the large sheet here. What, what page are you on? This is page two of three of the large sheets we were sent. Number three under technical services. Number one. Okay. <clears throat> ah, okay. I'm just curious, what are the estimated three large groundwater projects you're talking about here? Um, Gerard can help me out here, but uh, are you talking about the box under groundwater water well project reviews? Yes. Okay, uh, those mm -hmm. were the 2030 general plan uh, dr revised draft EIR. Uh, City of Oxnard, the South Shore and South Ormond Beach specific plans, City of Oxnard EIR, and the Santa Cruz specific plan. Is that correct, Gerhard? That's correct. And, and those, those are, are the minimum that we identified. Those in the blue over. box, you're referring to three large projects. That's that's what that is. Yes. Okay. Because we've never heard that here, but I suppose we wouldn't. Um, on the last page, page three, section two, item number six, resolution number 97-2, grandfathering issues. Um, it says revising a draft board letter. That's supposed to be in this packet. I didn't see that. Is that being pushed back? It's not being pushed back. It's just a little tougher to resolve before we bring to you. We're grappling with some balancing points to stay consistent with your guiding principles. We've heard from a variety of stakeholders what their points of view on that, and so we're trying to, in the first instance, uh, give you a product that uh, is worthy of consideration. So uh, we will be doing that in 10-11, uh, certainly within the first quarter. Okay. And then nine, uh, item eight, groundwater resource management grant program tasks. What was the intended use of that money from that state grant? 
Rick, I may look to you a little bit of help, but uh, for meters, meter telemetry, uh, replacement meters, and uh, with the data collection and perhaps a little, some model updating or modeling. So uh, help with the metering program, the new metering program? Yes. Uh, either assist them with the existing meter, meter calibration program, or uh, actually some telemetry. We've had some volunteers to, to where we can actually uh, have some automated readings and, and that data then submitted to uh, real time. Gerard, would that not require replacement of the meter though? Because on the, on the telemetry red meters that District 19 put in, of course they had to replace essentially the whole meter. Right. Now this isn't a requirement. Is that, did I answer your question? So the units you would have could read old meters? Dr. Kelly, there's a two uh, manufacturers that market a system that actually have a, a way to take a picture of the meter face and decode that and then submit the information. So they can be retrofitted on, on certain older meters. Thank you. Okay. There's one last question. Um, and I've heard it referred to in, in meetings outside this chamber, but obviously the GMA budgets or coffers are getting fat, and we've got now a significant uh, this Jim's fund for uh, uh, possible litigation problems, and then this uh, G Seep, if I'm saying that right, idea, which I think is a good one. Um, where are those funds being held? Well, all the, all the entire agency fund portfolio is held by the county treasurer's office. Uh, it is accounted for separately by the um, fund designations that in your budget, but they're commingled uh, as part of being in the county pooled investment fund, and we get the benefit of the interest of being in that fund. I guess where I'm going with this is, are they secure from a uh, state raid of special district monies that we read about in the newspaper a few weeks back? Well, I guess um, that's, a, that's an open question, but the general um, practice in the past has been it's been very, it's much, much been more difficult for the state to grab enterprise-related funds than it has uh, general funds or property taxation funds. Nothing, I suppose, is ultimately not possible but so far, the state has been not as successful in piercing uh, the access for enterprise-related funds. Would that be your assessment too, Jeff or Al? Al well, just speaking in general terms, uh, I don't know that anyone can say that the funds are safe from uh, the state there, but uh, I think it's probably less likely that you would see the state uh, affirmatively uh, taking those funds, then it would be the, the more likely scenario that they would withhold certain funding to local government. Um, and um, uh, just as a legal matter, I don't think the commingling of the funds and their being on deposit with the, uh, the county funds uh, provides the state with any additional leverage as, uh, against the GMA in terms of uh, acquiring those funds. So. Uh, the short answer I would say to your question is that uh, the, the funds are reasonably safe uh, on deposit with the county. Thank you. Okay. Any other members have questions? Anybody in the audience have questions? Okay. From um, an administrative standpoint, it says consider adoption, um, and since we took it out of the consent and, and uh, we, you want a motion to adopt this final annual work plan and budget? Is that what yes, you're asking? Sir. Okay. All right. Can I have a motion? Nothing I've moved has gotten past uh, <laughs> anything, so those guys are going to have to make the motion. <laughs> Um, I'll let her second it. Well, like, <laughs> like, do whatever you want, but I'm going to let Charlotte second it. I move we approve the uh, annual work plan and budget as uh, presented. Second. There's a second. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Mulhart? Yes. Director Craven? Yes. Director Kelly? Yes. Director Borchard? Yes. Okay, great. Let's go to, um, we have some informational items. Rick?
Good afternoon, Chair Mulhart, members of the board. For the record, Rick of your goots, I'll be presenting the item today. Update on development of the new GMA groundwater management software. Uh, before I get going, I did want to tell you that Mary Lintz from IT Services is here. When I finish with my slides, Mary will show you just some additional slides of the system so you can uh, see how it's coming together. And um, we'll move on after that. I can take questions at the end of my presentation or after Mary shows slides, whatever your pleasure is. In September 2009, the agency entered into a contract with IT Services to develop the new software application. And as you will likely recall, the purpose is to dramatically improve uh, the functionality regarding the way we're able to quantify groundwater extractions and also spot ordinance compliance issues uh, that um, have previously been more difficult to, to catch in a timely fashion. From a fiscal side, uh, it has a not to exceed cost of $143,060. It has an annual license and maintenance agreement of $12,680. And project closure um, is uh, July 15, 2010. The project does remain on budget, and the core functionality is expected to be completed by the end of June. That's what we're calling phase one. Uh, some items will be carried over towards the end of August to be completed by the end of August, I should say. Those deal with year-end filing issues, irrigation efficiency, and some other functions that uh, we moved, uh, moved out a little bit so we could make sure we finished the core functionality. Uh, user acceptance testing, data conversion, and other tasks are still underway. We're spending quite a bit of time on it. System development's 94% complete. And uh, we've completed user acceptance test three. There's one more to do, number four. And that hasn't been released by IT services yet. Data conversion is still ongoing. Uh, the final data conversion is scheduled to start June 25th. And we'll be doing additional QAQC for the mid-year reporting. So starting, well, essentially, at the end of this month, when we generate our semi-annual statements, we'll be using the new system and verifying that it is making the uh, statements the same as the old system to make sure we do that quality control check. And then we'll do additional checking at the end of this year, the end of 2010. So at the end of, uh, 2000, end of June 2010, the core functionality will be online. And we'll be using the new system starting in July, but uh, well owners and operators won't be fully utilizing the system until they're trained. Its training is necessary. It would include things as simple as creation of an online account and uh, for the operator to go in and confirm that we have the right information and the operator can select notification type. And importantly, after that administrative work is done, the operator will be able to file their semi-annual statements online, file for irrigation efficiency online, if they choose to do so. In addition, they can file for well permits and other um, ordinance authorized applications, transfers of allocation, baseline, those kinds of things. Uh, pilot testing is necessary prior to wider scale acceptance and use of the system. Uh, we desire that about 20 operators plus county fiscal services staff take part in the pilot testing starting in July and moving into August. Testing would include training for operators and uh, GMA staff as well, um, although we've been learning quite a bit about the system. And also training of county fiscal services on how electronically remitted funds are tracked. You, you might recall that the new system will allow people to pay online if they choose. And right now, uh, the GMA doesn't do that. So we want to make sure that uh, any payments made online are properly tracked with county fiscal services. Some of the benefits of pilot testing versus just sort of a wide scale attempt to distribute the system. Uh, it would maintain the number of new users at a manageable level. And if technical difficulties come up, we can handle them more easily. So it'll keep the rollout of the new system more manageable. Also, there's a timing element. Semi-annual statements are due to be released the first week of July. 
and the ordinance requires the reporting and payment within 45 days of that so it would be premature to get all the GMA operators that would like to enrolled in this new system so we need to do it gradually there just isn't enough time to do that right now so we propose to start with a small number of new users and then additional training will come online later this year so our plan for the 2010-1 period will use the old and the new system to generate all the semi-annual statements we'll verify they match and the semi-annual statements will be distributed through the US mail as usual We'll also include a, an, I'm calling it an advertisement, a, or a, we can call it a notification, just telling the GMA operators that there is a new system that it has become available that uh, they'll be able to use and uh, will probably include some, uh, uh, some facts about what the system does and how they can get um, enrolled into using the new system if they choose to do so. And we'll also process the selected semi-annual statements in the new system but we will use the old system to confirm that they match for the second half of this year we'll have a lower level of effort regarding using the old system but we'll still do some checking using the old system just to make sure uh, the semi-annual statements this round though at the end of the year will be distributed via email to those people that want to receive them through email there are some other considerations uh, the new system is new and uh, there may be glitches we don't fully anticipate before it goes online so we expect IT services will address these as they come up and also owner and operator use of the new system is voluntary so we want to make sure that uh, the rollout goes as smoothly as possible and this is our proposed schedule which is also in your staff report and it basically summarizes some of the dates that I talked about June to early July we'd seek and accept volunteers for pilot testing one of the reasons we wanted Mary to show some slides today is to show some of the other members of the audience that haven't seen the new system so they can see what uh, is coming available July through mid-August we'll conduct training and late August through early September we'll go over the results of the quality control checks September November we'll look at ideas to encourage more owners and operators to use the system and then additional training would occur uh, at the end of this year so that concludes my slides I can answer questions now if you'd like or I can have Mary come up now why don't you have Mary come up now okay Mr. Chairman members of the board thank you for the opportunity um, we've been working on the system since July. Can I have a laptop, please? Um, I'm sorry, not since July, since January. We've gone through system analysis and design, technical design, and, and finally the, the actual programming. The objective of this system was to allow the financial, um, or I'm sorry, the semi annual filing of statements for operators. We've also got some functionality in the system for owners, and we've got it fully functional for the FCGMA staff. Um, I'll just walk you through a couple of screens here. I'm going to log in as an operator. And what I can see here is the different functionality that's available for an operator. They've got only one um, application available to them, and that's transfer of historical credits they've got reporting they'll be able to see online their annual credit summary and they'll be able to get their ETO station information here looking at the current operator screen um, if there's any amount due on the account it will show up right here for them they can come in here modify their account uh, information privileges change their passwords select their their uh, preference for how they want to receive these messages down here is the notifications area anytime an application or a semi-annual filing is created in the system a notification will show up here for the operators it'll tell them how many notifications they've got if they've got any semi-annual extraction fees due it shows up here 
by selecting the com code up here. I hope that's the right one. Yes. I can see the number of wells that are associated with this com code. And as time goes on and we get the data conversion for the prior semiannual statements, there's a summary down here of what those statements entail. Looking on one of the wells, I can see what the extractions were for this particular well. I can see who the owner is and I can see how it's allocated. There's a GIS component where you can go out and, and look up the maps uh, for wells when you're filing a permit or when you're filing an a, um, irrigation efficiency statement. Those maps can be saved to the hard drive and then uploaded along with the, the application. Let's take a look at the semiannual statement itself. What this, I've already submitted this statement. It tells me what the reporting period is, tells me the status of it. Once a statement has been submitted, <clears throat> it can't be modified by the operator because it's actually been submitted to the Fox Canyon. Um, if you need to make an adjustment to that statement, we've got the ability to make a corrected bill to keep the history straight. Down here, I've got the com code I'm working with. I've got my uh, meter readings. These are being brought in by the prior statement filing. Um, if I enter in the, the current meter reading, there's a calculation of the difference and the acre feet is calculated for them. They have the ability to override the acre feet if they need to make a correction. There is no previous balance in this account, but I can see over here all of my historical credits that, that are allowed for this account. There's an extraction charge and this is all calculated automatically. Once it's been submitted, I have the opportunity to go into uh, the electronic payment system. It's called ePay and that's where you can you can pay by credit card or ACH. Give that a second to get into the cart. The good thing about this system is, is from the day one when the operators log into their system they're going to have access to all their historical semi-annual filings irrigation efficiency applications, baselines, transfers of credit. Oh, well, there you go. I feel just like Bill Gates. I apologize for that. Our ePay system is not working in the QA environment today, um, so I can't show you that. But essentially, they'll be able to add this semi-annual statement to a cart and walk through the payment system. The monies that are calculated through there are processed by a payment processor and transferred directly to the county treasury. The county treasury will in turn transfer that money into the FCGMA accounts and that's where they'll be reconciled by Fox Canyon County fiscal people. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Members, any uh, questions or comments? Thank you very much. Sounds great. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm pleased that we're moving along and that we're going to meet uh, most of our deadlines and uh, I think there's going to be a transition period, obviously. There's going to be training going involved. Um, the only question I had was <clears throat> for you to see that there is a semi-annual report that you have to do, you have to go to, you have to log on into the system that a, that a new semi-annual requirement has been, has been uploaded into your system you have to go to your system to find out if that is in fact true. Is yeah, I, I hear your question, Mary. Okay. That's not. Uh, we're not sending reminders to people is there, via email. Yeah, is there a subsystem? Is there a sub? The way it's set up, the way you demonstrated it was, I have to go into. I have to remember the first of July or whenever, uh, depending on when we're period reporting, to go into the system to look at it to see if the semi-annual report for that period has been uploaded. Uh, no, you won't have to log into the system. When an operator chooses their preference on how they're going to receive notifications, there's U.S. mail and email as options. So even though the statement will show on their home page, they'll also get notifications. Ah, okay, okay. I didn't catch that. Okay. Email. So they'll get a separate email saying, hey, go to your page. It's been uploaded. It's now time to file. Or a snail mail. Or snail mail. Either way, we'll get them. Okay. I have a quickie. Uh, yeah. How does GMA verify that the funds have been allocated from the county treasury to the GMA account? 
What's there's, the accounting process? There? There's reporting in both ePay that shows um, all the transactions that have been taken for a given period. You can search by a date range or even one day. There's reporting from the payment processor that um, tells what funds have settled, and that's reconciled against the Treasury, and then the Treasury will load that money into a GMA account. And GMA will then reconcile against this system to make sure that the, the funds balance between the filings that have been paid electronically and those that have not. So GMA receives those notices from the e-payer as well as the Treasury? They have an account into, into e-pay, but most of the notification will come through the Treasury. GMA is not going to utilize e-pay in its full functionality. It's basically just a payment engine. I'm thinking simply. I mean, it's, it's they're not going to get a bank statement and then be able to look at it and reconcile it. It's been moved into their account, or how does that work? No, they won't get a bank statement. They'll get notifications from the Treasury's office through journal vouchers and, and things so like that. So it's all handled within the Treasurer's office? It, the money comes in through the Treasury's office and is transferred to GMA, and the reconciliation between what's been paid in the Fox Canyon database and what's been deposited into the Treasury, that's where that reconciled will take place. Right. So GMA just received a notice from Treasury that this is what's been transferred in. Correct. Well, in fact, that there was a meeting earlier this week to discuss the details of that board and board chart, and we haven't finished uh, that, but the idea was that the GMA will have an independent way to check the transaction numbers that ePay has against what the Treasury sends them. But um, that discussion between fiscal and IT services isn't complete yet, so we don't have a full answer for you. But there will be reconciliation on the far end by GMA fiscal staff. That's what I'm getting at. Thank you. Okay. Any um, any other questions on on this item? Okay. Keep Move to receive and file. Okay. We're, one last item. Oh. The historical reporting that we have done over the last umpteen years will that be carried into this system so that when I pull my records up online, I can see what I've reported over the last ten years? Yes. You'll okay. be able to see that. Okay, very good. All right, good. Anybody else? I nice. second the motion. Okay, motion is second to accept it. And all in favor? Thank you, Mayor. Aye. Aye. Okay, let's go to item number four. You got, you got the supervisor, Bennett, has joined us. Okay. All right. Which of your nifty charts do you want us to start with? Well, actually, uh, hold the charts in abeyance because we have an automated press or an animated one that I think makes it more clear. It's, I don't right. believe this is complicated, but it has taken some time to get all the T's crossed and the I's dotted. Uh, for the record, Gerard Kapusik with Watershed Protection and Age District and Agency Staff. Um, I'm here today to essentially give you an informational report that pretty much uh, completes the, process, the forensic process of both bounding the boundaries uh, and lays uh, the uh, basis for the next steps, which is action under the uh, settlement agreement by the uh, Pleasant Valley County Water District and United, United Water Conservation District to wrap it up and then bring it back for final approval. Uh, this has taken a little bit longer than we had thought, but I think the effort was well worth it. Uh, there are three specific objectives that were accomplished here. First of all, we were responding to a request by one of the stakeholders to correct a map which was not correct as part of the settlement agreement, even though it does not hit the correction of that Guadalasca mutual water map does not in any way compromise what's in the settlement agreement, but it simply corrects a mistake in the boundary of that map. Uh, secondly, to the extent that we do not have specific statutory requirement or, or a statutory language that compels mutual water companies to give us boundary information, this fills a gap. And this, this company has worked with us, as, or actually both companies have, to make sure that that gap is closed. Uh, and thirdly, it helps us provide the information to your board and stakeholders in managing uh, extraction. So uh, with that, uh, let me just go ahead and launch. Uh, essentially, our objective here today is reconfirm how we got here, uh, recap the results that have occurred since the last time we went before you, which was April of 2009, and you're giving us direction to continue work to, to complete this project, and then report that results. 
I'm happy to say that I believe we have representatives from all of the affected stakeholders here today. We have at least three of the four quartet of distinguished ACWA consigliere here who we've worked with on this, and we have representatives from both the Thornhill and Guadalasca Mutual Water Companies. I believe Mr. McKee is here from Thornhill, and Mr. Broom is here from Guadalasca. So I think Sam, by the way, really appreciated that description of who's here. I mean, they're still chuckling away. Thanks, Sam. Who is Sam? <laughs> Uh, in any event, I we have all the players, so you'll, you're, you'll have the full um, suite of, of folks to answer questions. This essentially is a static slide. This is the map that's currently uh, attached as Exhibit A to the Thornhill Miller um, Water Company. The ground zero area is the gray area, and what I mean by that is everything that's in that gray area is subject to the uh, restrictions of use of, of local ground water, requirement for uh, foreign or, or water that is not local ground water if there's a request to irrigate it and has amortization period. Uh, so uh, what's at issue here is the boundaries of Guadalasca, and it's hard to see because there's a lot of information on this map, but particularly in the area in the southwest, oops, and this area here were incorrect. There were additional parcels that were in the Guadalasca uh, Mutual Water Company that should have been reflected on the map, and that's the primary uh, scope of the request that Rob Sawyer, on behalf of Thornhill uh, Entities, sent us in August of 2008, which launched this project. We also discovered that the boundary of Thornhill here was incorrect. Uh, in other words, it should extend out, and you'll see that in a minute. So we're effectively correcting two boundary issues, uh, Guadalasca here and Thornhill here. But we are not in any way, shape or form, changing the extant restrictions, covenants that are in, that's in the ground zero gray area. We're simply correcting on the margin. So now we'll get to our little animated slide. <clears throat> this was the original uh, GM... Uh, a GMWC boundary that was on the records of the, of the Groundwater Management Agency through our water purveyor. This was the original boundary of the Thornhill Miller Water Company that were in our records at the time we were working through the settlement map. So this was the baseline condition, the spatial baseline condition we were dealing with. In 2006, prior to the settlement agreement, uh, a design survey was commissioned to establish by parcels the boundaries that were in the Guadalajara Mutual Water Company. And you can see uh, where the difference lied. This large sort of trapezoidal area here is somewhat moot. It, it's, it was in the GMWC, but it's federal and state lands, um, as is this area up in here. But this sort of irregular shaped area and down in here are the subject of the corrections to Guadalajara. And it took us a considerable amount of time to pin this down, do due diligence, and get everyone to agree that, in fact, was the case, including the Guadalajara Mutual Water Company shareholders, which in an email that was sent to me on the 21st uh, of this month from Rob Sawyer, I'm sorry, Rob Saperstein, confirms that uh, informally uh, they've met and they agree uh, with uh, those boundaries as shown. So what was proposed to be added were the crosshatch areas to the boundary. Now it gets a little complicated because in this area you have overlying boundaries. You have Thornhill underneath and Guadalajara on top or vice versa. Uh, uh, on June the 7th, I believe it is, um, or perhaps it's June the 3rd, yes, June the 3rd, um, Mr. Miller came into our office and he said, well, wait a minute, this, uh, this area here should be shown in both Thornhill and Guadalajara. So, um, and we've confirmed that that is in fact the case. So that's essentially what is now reflected on what will be the replacement map. And I'm sorry to say that it, it's a little tough to read at this scale, but it does reflect those spatial boundaries. We've included insets here showing that same information I've just shown you. Um, we are informed by the recorder's office that they do not have the ability to color, uh, to record color code, color documents, so we have to deal with the black and white documents. So in effect, this is what is, is being proposed to be uh, adopted as the second amendment to the Thornhill Miller Settlement Agreement, and a draft of that language is included. I did pass out to you uh, some minor corrections, uh, the deletion of the word qualified service area for 
It was contextually inappropriate and it was a mistake to have that in there, and we were requested to change that, and we concur. It doesn't in any way change what the essence of the resolution or of the commitments and covenants and restrictions. So I believe I've pretty much taken this as far as I can. We plan to schedule, request scheduling at the United and Pleasant Valley County Water Districts as part of the settlement agreement, the three-party settlement agreement. Assuming that they approve that, when we return to your board, we assume that would be a consent item and we'll be finished with this problem. So I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have. Okay. Any members have any questions? Anybody in the audience have any questions? Rob. Rob Saperstein for Guadalajara Mutual Water Company. I just, two, three points perhaps. I wanted to first thank Gerard and county staff and GMA staff. This was a real project to go forensically, make sure we've got all the proper parcels, what happened to parcels, do all the historical analysis. And county, both Gerard and county GIS staff were terrific in generating three overlays and a very complex map. So we really appreciate that. It helps us do our work and making sure the companies understand where we're within GMA boundaries, where we're within PV boundaries, where we're within United boundaries, and all of that madness in overlapping jurisdictions. So very much appreciate that. I just wanted to remind the board also that Guadalajara is not a signatory to the underlying Miller-Thornhill settlement agreement. The reason Guadalajara is involved is that the Miller-related entities have overlapping boundaries with Guadalajara, and Mr. Miller and some of the entities in which he's involved have also an entitlement to receive water from Guadalajara. So we're tangentially involved in the overall method in which the settlement agreement is implemented. But otherwise, Guadalajara shareholders have consented to, agreed to, acquiesced to this depiction of their outermost boundary of their service area. And as far as we're concerned, it's appropriate for the multiple entities to take action. And in case the board has questions, Mr. McKee, who is the manager for the Thornhill-related entities, is also here if you need any further contact from their perspective. Okay. You had three things. What was the third thing? I think that was the third. You know, you're losing your mind. I'm not saying. Maybe that was the third. Oh, geez. Okay, great. Anybody else have anything? All right. This is an informational item. You don't need direction from the board? It is, unless you choose to give us direction. No. First of all, in my time here, way back when, we would have never had the ability to reproduce and forensically reconstruct what we have. It's unbelievable with technology and patience and what we can do today to reconstruct what the history is. So I appreciate the work you did. I appreciate all the entities involved getting this issue resolved. It doesn't change the settlement. It is what it is, but it does set the boundaries. So very good. And if I could just take 30 seconds, because Rob Saperstein made a critical point. You know, often we are here, but the hard work is done by some very extraordinary professionals that have worked with us. And I want to name two of them specifically in this project. Jeff Dorrington, who was instrumental in sitting down with us and transmitting our thoughts and efforts and what-ifing into these documents. And he's done a superlative job and has been an extraordinary help to us and is a great asset. And Sheila has also, Sheila Lopez has also been critical in terms of the data, the underlying data. So we can't do this without pulling together. Okay. And I just want your board to be conscious of that, because they're not here often enough. Okay. I'm glad you brought that to our attention, and my thanks to all of them. Okay. Move for Stephen File. Stephen File. Second. I'm a second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Let's go to item number five, please. Afternoon, Chair Mulhart, directors. For the record, Brian Bondi with United Water Conservation District Agency staff. Item five is your monthly update on the status and progress of the Las Posas Basin specific management plan. Since the last update on this item, there's been two meetings, one in May and one this morning. Items 5A and 5B in your packet include the meeting materials from the May meeting and the updated attendance statistics from the May meeting. Attendance has remained within the historical trends that we've been tracking since last year. During both the May meeting and again 
uh, this morning uh, at the June meeting, uh, the discussions have focused largely on the groundwater management alternatives. And these are approaches to addressing the one to 2,000 approximate over acre feet overdraft uh, in the West Las Posas Basin and the approximate 5,000 acre foot overdraft in the uh, combined East and South Las Posas Basins. Uh, additionally, today the group uh, began discussing um, the concept of basin management objectives and how these objectives and the management strategies might be tailored to specific areas within the basins themselves. So we're starting to talk about the differences of different areas within the individual west, east, and south Las Posas basins. And it looks like that may be the direction the group is headed. Uh, the group also discussed a proposed schedule for completing the basin plan by the end of 2011 and perhaps more importantly discuss what uh, is expected to be achieved with that plan in terms of the content and approach. And looks like where we're headed is recognizing the existing information that we have, the uncertainties in that information both geologically and with respect to infrastructure, desalters, supplemental water, salinity management pipeline, the ability to tap into that, how much it costs to tap into that. Those considerations and uncertainties are going to have to be folded in, and what we're looking towards is what I would characterize as an initial plan that's going to have an adaptive management approach, and it's going to be something that is going to have to be revisited periodically as we gain more information, as we improve our technical understanding, as we learn more about costs uh, for the infrastructure that will provide supplemental water, which will ultimately be how we achieve safe yield in those basins. Uh, that concludes the update on this item, unless there's any questions from your board or from the stakeholders in the audience. Okay, any members, questions? Anybody in the audience, questions? Okay, thanks, Brian. Mr. Stephen Fine. Okay. Second. All in favor? Peach Aye. Aye. Okay, opposed, Aye. All right, let's go to um, item six. Okay, again, for the record, Brian Bonney, United Water and Agency staff. Uh, item six is related to item five in that it's the <coughs> proposed extension of emergency ordinance D, which is the emergency ordinance which was adopted for the Las Posas Basins to create a timeout for the basin plan to be developed. Um, as you might recall, this ordinance was adopted originally in February 2009 and includes a temporary moratorium on well permits for new or expanded groundwater uses and institutes a four acre feet per acre cap on irrigation efficiency. Those are the two prohibitions contained in the ordinance. Uh, you might also recall that the original scheduled expiration date was January 1, 2010. Your board acted to extend that expiration date to June 30th, 2010 at the December 09 board meeting. So this has been extended for six months once already. And today you're receiving a request to consider extending it for another six months to the end of this calendar year. Um, since December, the users group, Cayagas, and agency staff have continued to meet monthly, work diligently on discussing the management alternatives, which are ultimately the heart of the plan. Additional time, again, is going to be needed to uh, come to consensus on what those approaches are, including uh, further discussions about how they'll work together and costs and so on and so forth. So the purpose of this request, again, is to extend the quote-unquote timeout to let that process continue for another six months. Um, as I mentioned in the previous update, the group discussed uh, the schedule for the rest of the year. And at this time, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mr. Gromlich to provide a little bit more detail about that, and then I'll close with recommendations. Thank you, Brian. For the record, Henry Gromlich, Cayagas Municipal Water District. Uh, we had hoped to have a printed schedule for you today, but as part of the stakeholder process, which is uh, quite lively at these meetings, uh, we're really still in the process of developing what the work plan will be and will be provided to the group on, in July. But based on the discussion today, essentially it consists of four, and I will have all four items, uh, Chair Mulhart, uh, four items that uh, <laughs> that uh, I, I am keeping score wrong. right. You need, heard need, that, need you? to be addressed. <laughs> and as Brian is, has mentioned, uh, what started out to be a seemingly pretty straightforward approach to doing a management plan has uncovered a lot of geological uh, facts that were hitherto really not appropriately understood. And so we hope to characterize what we know about the hydrogeology and the surface and groundwater interactions at this time, 
but uh, also uh, develop a more robust monitoring program uh, within the next six months. And that monitoring program will have two parts to it. One will be a monitoring program that is essentially ringing the Cayagas Aquifer Storage and Recovery, thereby uh, helping us to manage our withdrawals uh, along with our neighbors pumping and not unduly interfere with that. And the second element of the monitoring will be broader based and will essentially be tracking the inflows and outflows of the Las Posas Basin. And we hope to better characterize uh, the way in which the surface water and groundwater interact by having that monitoring program in place. Uh, further, the technical uh, part of the schedule will include further defining management areas. Uh, as Brian has indicated, we have a very rich, diverse uh, set of factors. We have parts of the West Las Posas that seem to have actually come into equilibrium, and we also have the deepest uh, pumping depression in the easternmost part of the West Las Posas. We have water quality issues in the East Las Posas that vary from north to south. And so finding the appropriate management area is going to be key to developing a program that actually meets the needs of the stakeholders. And then finally, as Brian mentioned, we intend to have a research agenda that will be ongoing so that as we uh, better define what it is that we don't know, uh, we get ourselves on track to finding out what we need to know in order to effectively manage the resource. Uh, besides the technical aspect, concurrently we're going to be uh, developing a supplemental supply uh, evaluation, and that is already underway. It involves understanding the feasibility of brackish groundwater desalting, and as Brian mentioned, that is in part going to be dependent on the status of the brine line and how that moves forward, as well as characterization of that water resource and how it can be developed. Finally, uh, as third part, we have the coordination with the existing groundwater resource. And that also will be concurrent because once we have the amount and the cost of supplemental supplies, our hope is to blend that and provide flexibility to the agricultural community so that using a sustainable groundwater supply and helping to invest in supplemental supplies, they have the water that they need in order to conduct their business and make business decisions. And then finally, the fourth element, there is an administrative aspect to this which involves coordination with GMA staff to incorporate uh, this work into the GMA ordinance and coordination with the SALTS TMDL that's been adopted by the regional board. It's a ambitious amount of work to be complete and uh, we will have something, essentially we have five meetings. Three of those meetings will be these concurrent tasks. Two of those meetings will be devoted to integrating uh, the parts of that. And we hope to have a plan to you at your meeting on December 1st. Okay, great. Thanks, Henry. Okay, Brian. Um, just a couple other items um, related to the ordinance. Um, again, the, the two prohibitions, the moratorium on well permits and the cap on irrigation efficiency. Uh, just an update on those items. Uh, to date, there have been no permit applications received. However, we have received a verbal request for a variance. You may recall there's a provision for a variance permit for wells uh, where the operator could demonstrate no net detriment. Uh, we believe we have a condition that will meet those requirements uh, for a domestic well in an area that has no other options for water. The individual has been cut off from their shared well that is uh, with other neighbors that has collapsed. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we anticipate receiving that application and proceeding uh, with appropriate conditions on that. Okay. That would be a de minimis use, something on the order of one or two acre feet per year. Okay. This the the recommendation is to. Um extend emergency ordinance D, this will become revision three, um, or revision two, June 23rd, 2010, as it's written here. That is correct. That, that's the motion. Um, is there any, any members that have any questions? Anybody in the audience have any questions? Um, I, 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 I have to again say that the work that the folks are doing up in that area to solve their water problem to do it in a cooperative manner, 
to come up with a long-term solution to meet the GMA's objectives, their own objectives, protect the aquifer, and do all the things we're doing. Uh, it is a complicated issue, as Henry outlined. And extending this emergency ordinance, everybody in that area understands what we're doing because we're moving forward with the, the monthly meetings and the briefings I've gotten are you are making progress, good progress. So as long as we're making progress and moving forward, I have no problems extending the emergency ordinance because ultimately it's the agreement that will bring uh, some balance to what's going on up in that area. So with that, if somebody wants to make a... Uh, one one uh, point you may want to consider in your motion, there's a typo in the revision that you're considering adopting. Uh, Article 3 prohibitions, subsection C, about midway through, um, the word code appears twice. There, you may want to strike one of those. Okay. You don't want a code code? <laughs> we don't need double codes. <laughs> no. All right, a motion to... Um, uh, extend emergency ordinance D revision to June 23rd 2010 with the uh, typo change as described can I have a motion for that mr. chairman I would move that we adopt emergency ordinance D revision to the June 23rd appearing as item 6a in our handbook with the deletion of code code second all right any other discussion comments okay roll call please Chair Mulhar? Yes. Director Craven? Yes. Director Bennett? Yes. Director Kelly? Yes. Director Borchard? Yes. Okay, thanks, Brian. Hey, uh, item number seven. Chair Mulhar, before you move to item number seven, uh, uh, something I probably should have brought up during an agenda review. Uh, it came to our attention late. Um, there's a member of the audience who wishes to speak on item number nine. Um, that person has to leave. It has a three o'clock commitment. And uh, you might want to factor that into your consideration of the next three, of the order of the next three items. Okay. Um, let Bruce is here. Okay. Let's just jump, jump to nine. Okay. We'll jump to nine, and then we'll go back to seven and eight in sequence. Okay. Again, for the record, Brian Bondi, United Water and Agency Staff. Item 9 is proposed adoption of Ordinance 8.3. Um, today we will um, <clears throat> review the ordinance for a second time, uh, discuss the comments that were received and how we propose to address them, and then if it's your pleasure, uh, proceed for public hearing and potential adoption. Could I please have uh, the presentation for Item 9? Thank you. Um, as you know, staff have been working through a list of ordinance code updates. Um, ordinance 8.3 is addressing uh, topic number 10. This is the tracking table we've been using for this project. Um, and topic number 10 uh, relates to things uh, pertaining to flow metering requirements and reporting extractions. Uh, the issues that the proposed ordinance update uh, will consider uh, include clarifying the requirements to report extractions, uh, calling out exceptions to flow metering requirements. The third is adding specificity to the flow meter installation requirements, and lastly, uh, including some requirements for notifications when flow meters fail. Those are the four items that we're uh, bringing for your consideration. Uh, as you, you listen to the presentation, you may want to follow along with either item 9A, 9B or 9C. 9B is the actual ordinance you're being asked to consider today. 9C is a red line strikeout version of the proposed changes from the actual ordinance code. Section 2.3, uh, reporting extractions. Um, currently, Section 2.3 of the Ordinance Code reads, the method for computing extractions shall be specified at, in chap by Chapter 3. Chapter 3 deals with metering. The issue here is that the co Ordinance Code is implying that only metered extractions should be reported to the agency. Staff recommending that all extractions be reported to the agency, whether they're metered or not. 
that's the distinction that we're trying to make here with the proposed language that we would be adding in two, section 2.3, which would read, all extraction shall be reported to the agency. All extraction shall be flow metered in accordance with the requirements and methods of flow metering and extractions as specified in Chapter 3. And in cases where flow metering is not required, the volume of water extracted shall be estimated and reported to the agency. That is the proposed change. Second proposed change. Um, I just mentioned cases where flow metering may not be required. Um, we're proposing to add language to call out two common situations where operators typically would not run their, their pumped water through their flow meter. The first is well flushing. This is a, a regular event for some well operators. Basically, upon startup, after the well's been sitting, the quality of the water, either chemically or sand content, may be not good enough to send through the distribution system, may cause damage to your distribution system, may cause damage to your plants, uh, your crops, et cetera. So it's a common practice for some operators to pump to waste, pump off a discharge line upstream of the meter, that water goes somewhere else. Obviously, if you're discharging upstream of your meter, you're not metering the water, we would like to see this water estimated and reported along with metered extractions. The other and less common uh, situation where water may not be flow metered is during well rehabilitation events. Basically, that's where you're having a pump contractor come out and try and restore the capacity of your well. The whole pump's pulled out typically, they're using their equipment, obviously you're not using your flow meter. Same thing, estimate the water that's produced during that event, report it along with your metered extractions. The third group of <coughs> proposed changes had to do with flow meter installation requirements. And at the first reading, we had included two proposed installation requirements. The first was that the flow meter should be installed upstream of all connections, except any that are used for flushing, like I just described. That would be shown here on the left, where you have the well, the motor, water's being discharged. This is a flushing line. Water comes through, goes through the flow meter before any other connections that may be downstream. That's what we're, we're, we're putting language in, or recommending language, that that be the typical installation. Compare that with the picture on the right, where you have water coming out of the well, and here's a connection that goes perhaps to another operator, another piece of property, we don't know. But this would be the example of what we would be trying to prevent, an unmetered line. Okay. The second requirement that was contained in the first reading was basically a requirement to install flow meters in accordance with manufacturer specs. The reason for that is meters are designed to work uh, with uh, laminar flow conditions going through the pipe. That's how the sensors are designed to read flow. When you have connections like this right upstream of the flow meter or downstream of the flow meter, you create eddy currents and other things. The meters do not read accurately. Um, we've actually decided, uh, based on uh, discussions with Mr. Smith from the city of Camarillo and others, uh, and also in consult consultation with experts at Micrometer, one of the larger ma meter manufacturers, uh, to remove this requirement um, because it appears that it would be burdensome for many operators to actually be able to plumb their system in a way where you have sufficient distance before and after the flow meter to create those laminar flow conditions. This would be an example here where you've got a, a gated area, there's not a lot of room, can't extend this line out very much further and get that distance. So what we're proposing to do instead, not today, is to come back and modify resolution 2008 which has the flow metering requirements. And what we'd be considering to do there is requiring the operators to test when they're doing their calibration at a variety of flow, flow rates and pressure conditions. The concern that the expert at Micrometer had was that you may test at one flow condition, flow and pressure, get an accurate reading, but if you have different back pressure conditions, higher flow, lower flow, it could be completely off. So he recommended that. And along with discussions with Mr. Smith, that's the conclusion we came to for a compromise to assure that uh, metering is done accurately, but yet not burden the, the pumpers unnecessarily. So again, that requirement has been removed for the second reading. The fourth uh, set of changes <coughs> excuse me, have to do with notifications when flow meters fail. Um, you might recall from Resolution 2008 
Again, that's the quote-unquote flow metering resolution. Um, there's a limit on the time duration in which backup measurement methods can be used. That's a 60-day limit. In other words, when your meter fails, you have 60 days to replace or repair it. And during that time, if you used an approved backup method, everything's great. The issue and proposed solution here is that currently the ordinance and the, that resolution don't require any notification of the agency. So agency staff don't know if a meter's failed. We typically find out at the next filing that a meter's failed. Numbers don't match. We've got a, a big research project to help you know, bring everything back into uh, correct records and get everything updated. Um, additionally, during the time frame, we don't have any way of assisting the operator with compliance. So we're proposing that when a meter fails, that we have a 10-day notification requirement. So your meter fails, you have 10 days, fill out a one-page form, let us know what's going on, let us help you get back into compliance. Same thing with the backup methods. There's, there's approved backup flow measuring methods that you can use during that 60-day period. If you need a variance for that, it's allowed in the ordinance. But again, 60 days, we don't know what's going on, we can't help you. We find out six months later, we've got a big mess. So this is all about communication, helping the operators get back into compliance. Um, one additional note on that, we did receive some comments after uh, we went to print. Um, you know, this was designed for the typical operator who probably doesn't have a spare calibrated flow meter ready to install. Apparently there are some operators who have extra meters ready to go, and we may want to consider adjusting this for those cases. In other words, they wouldn't need to perhaps um, do the notification if they're just ready to go, if you just swap it out same day. So that's something to consider, and I think we'll hear comments to that effect. Lastly, a couple little cleanup issues. Um, we've, we had multiple terms all representing this concept of metering. We're proposing to re remove everything, uh, metering equipment, meter, and just use the term flow meter. So you'll see that change throughout the document. And lastly, we added definitions for the two terms that I described earlier, well flushing and well rehabilitation. Uh, notifications, uh, since the first reading, uh, we did the required uh, public notice in the newspaper, and we also sent out uh, this postcard to all the registered operators uh, within the agency, just letting them know that uh, the proposed ordinance was coming. They could download, take a look at it, send us comments. So, I got a postcard. You got your postcard. Good. Okay. Um, with that, I propose that uh, you consider opening a public hearing and consider an option. Okay. Um, can I hold your question just for a second, um, Marty? Did you want to speak on this uh, before three o'clock? Let me let me let Marty speak on this before three o'clock, and then you can incorporate okay. your question in that. If you want to speak on this, Marty. We need to open the public hearing. Uh, oh, I've uh, opened the public hearing. Is that Al? Did I do that right? Thanks. Yeah. Is this the one you use, or is this the one you use? Which one? The big one? Marty. Thank you very much. I'm Martin Gramko. I want to, uh, first of all, thank staff for working with me on this issue. You know, I got the little card. I read the, the changes, and I thought, well, gosh, you know, there's some issues here. I need to make some comments, which we did. And, and you guys have been really good about responding to them and listening to what I have to say. So I, I want to, you know, give them some kudos there. Um, yeah, I'm one of those uh, farmers that has, you know, a lot of wells, and um, we're, and we, we read them constantly, uh, especially during this current economic downturn where we might not be farming the entire ranch and we are sharing the wells with other, with strawberry growers or celery growers. And I ultimately take on the responsibility, the burden of, of reporting and maintaining and making sure everything is right relative to the GMA. And um, to the extent that one of uh, the people I'm sharing the water with is maybe over pumping, I want to know right away. So we take, if I'm sharing a well, I actually take a reading every time I turn the meter on and off. So I know, I know immediately. The meter didn't move since the last time we, uh, we ran it. So we know that the meter died. And 
Um, <clears throat> to the extent I am not sharing a well, I, I take it monthly just because I calculate my efficiency at the end of the month and I determine whether or not, you know, I want to know before the end of the year whether I'm going to be into an efficiency uh, a problem. Um, beyond that, we irrigate using efficiency. That's how we estimate how much water to use. We look at it for the week and it tells us about right and then we adjust it for each crop. Um, point being that I have essentially in, in, you know, 20 meters and three different installation types. Uh, and for each one of those installation types, I've got a meter sitting in the shop, certified from the chronometer, ready to go. So um, as soon as we know that the meter's broken, you know, I've got a staff of, you know, 15 mechanics out there. It's their job to keep the trucks running and everything. So we, you know, the meter comes out, new meter goes in. We don't lose, we don't lose much time once a meter, once we determine that a meter is broken. And what I was just hoping that we wouldn't have to do is the reporting requirement. You know, the idea that and we have a lot of reporting requirements, and you know, it's I can just see myself forgetting to, to contact Dave. Gosh, Dave, you know, we we, we fixed the meter. Um, I just see that happening, and I don't want to be in a position where where I now have some penalty to pay because I didn't I didn't report it. And certainly at the at the semiannual period, you're going to get it. Um, I'm going to not only tell you. Uh, what the original meter was, what the final meter reading was when it broke, what the new meter uh, reading was when it went in, the day it went in, the day we indicated that, you know, all of the information that you would be looking for to be able to make sure that there are no gaps um, in the measurement of the water. So, um, and, and I think we, you know, I think you heard what I had to say. I'm sure, Jeff, you know, Jeff heard what we had to say. We were, you know, hopefully going to provide um, some some out for those of us that are trying to do our best here. You know, we're doing what we can, and you know that that, that requirement would be nice to get get rid of. And the last piece that we had um, was regarding uh, fees and enforcement. Yeah, um, there is a section in there, and I think again we've we've already agreed that this doesn't make any sense. The the section reads that. Um, let's see it. If any water production facility within the agency's boundaries is used <clears throat> is used to produce water without a flow meter or a non-operating flow meter, the agency will assess a non-metered water use fee. And um, again, there are going to be times where you know if you might have a couple of days, you might have a month. There might be there's going to be some time by the time you establish the fact that the meter is broken, you actually have to go back two readings, right? Because it might have been broken the last time, you just didn't see it yet. But there's going to be some time where you're going to have to estimate some water use, and, and as long as you're using an approved method, you know it doesn't seem right that you should be charging um, a, a, a double fee for that water. And finally, um, when the time comes, I just like an opportunity to take a look at what those, you know, acceptable backup methods are. Hopefully, we don't have to have two sets of meters on, on every well. Okay. Um, uh, before uh, Marty, before you go, you, you had a question. Let's. Um, I have questions of him too. Would you like me to yeah, ask yeah, them and well, hold my qu other question because what, do both of your questions. the other one doesn't involve this? Okay. Okay. Uh, my second question was: uh, You uh, said, "Well, you might have to if if it's broken, it might take a while to figure it out. You might have to go back." Uh, would you agree? I, I'm trying to look at how we can craft something without having an ordinance that's totally wide open. Uh, because there are abusers, um, would you suggest a time limit or? Well, I think we did, and, and it's, it's in the ordinance already. The the idea that um, you know any any estimated water use beyond 60 days, you know at that at that point you haven't you haven't really, in my opinion, and I may have some pumpers that are going to shoot me for this, but. In my opinion, you haven't really done your due diligence. I mean, we are all here. We all understand that meters need to work. And, we, and if we're not looking at our meters, at least when the irrigator turns them on and off, we maybe have failed in our obligations there. So there, we, we, I believe that there is some time period that you need to give us to, you know, to get it fixed. And to the extent that, you know, to the, there's a difference between my laborer reading the meter and my production manager reading the meter. It's just, you know, I, I, he's looking for that. He's looking for the broken meter. He's looking to see that the, that the water use is useful. And when I'm farming and not sharing, I'm going to read it monthly. So the reason I think 60 days is reasonable is that 
what's likely to happen is that you, you, you take your reading and it either is exactly the same as the last reading, which was 30 days prior, or it moved just a little bit and your common sense says, that's not right. Well, if it moved just a little bit, you, probably can, you can probably assume that it broke in that 30 days. Make the estimate. We're going to fix it immediately anyway. It makes the estimation in, you know, using the previous 30 days. If it didn't move at all, you really have to go back another reading and say, all right, I've got to do 60 days worth of estimation because I really don't know where this guy broke. And uh, you know, I don't know that, it, that it's reasonable to ask us to read our reading, you know, our, our, our meters, uh, you know, every day. I mean, we happen to do it sometimes, but I mean, it's, you know, doing it monthly and looking at it monthly, and you know, with all of the other things that we're doing, it just it just feels right to me. It feels reasonable. Okay, right. you talked also about uh, you are one of the farmers who has uh, spare meters in your back pocket, so to speak. Uh, other farmers don't, uh, and and you spoke to perhaps having some uh, exclusion of a reporting uh, for people who do have those uh, spare meters and can replace them uh, quickly. How would we know, as the GMA, who has them and who doesn't? You don't need to know. Um, what you, what you need to know is that. Well, we need to know so that we can expect some people to report and other people. Well, you're going to get from whoever, wherever, whenever the meter breaks, from whoever reports it to you is going to indicate to you that the meter is broken. That the day that they, the day that they determined it was broken, they can also tell you the last time they read it. And the day that it broke, they should be able to tell you how long it took them to fix it. Now, if you don't have a meter ready to go, I mean, given the new meter ordinance, that's. <laughs> You know, these meters are hard to get. They're, they don't just, you know, I've, the reason I have meters now is because I have too many of them fail and I've waited sometimes months to get them. So, you know, in the end, it's, it's cheaper for me, and I think for any pumper, to have a meter just ready to rock because the water is expensive. Especially when you get into this twice. I mean, I, I pumped, I had a thousand dollar bill on one meter at just the GMA bill in May on one of our ranches and if that was doubled that was a thousand dollar fine for 30 days you know I mean so I, mean, I don't know if I, if I if I answered your question I mean I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to directly answer that question other than I think it's it makes sense for all of us to do what we can to try to identify broken meters fix them as fast as we can and to the extent we are doing that well, I'm just trying to figure out how, how we're going to operate because our assumption has been everybody's not going to have a replacement meter. And your assumption is most people would. So what, in your, ex your answer to me, I'm gathering you'd like this part taken out instead of just changing it so that we're excluding people who have the spare meters. On the assumption that everybody's not going to have a spare meter, how would how would we do it? I'm trying to respond to what you're asking us. Okay, so if, let's say let's say you gave somebody okay. 60 uh, days. All right, Marty, before you answer that, I, I just I just have a suggestion, and I know you're going to be leaving soon, so I want to throw out the suggested answer to okay. Charlotte that, and see what your thoughts are. And that is, you know, your contention is most people should have the, the replacement meters, and you don't want to have a reporting requirement just because you replace the meter, and you're going to replace the meter very promptly after you discover it. So what if we change the language and the language said you don't have to report any meter that you change if you change the meter within 10 days of discovering that it's a problem? Absolutely perfect. In fact, I, I should have just came to that. I actually suggested some code similar, some wording similar to that. And that way if somebody has to take you know, a long time. Well, we want to know that somebody's taken some time, but if people are prompt, they find out about it, they do it within 10 days, um, then they, you know, they don't have to even... You have to report by exception rather than by... And, and you'll see that on, a, on the semi-annual statement, because at that point in time, at least at least the way I report it, and maybe you should require it, that, you know, you'll, you'll see, when there's another meter on there, there should be some discussion, some information as to, all right, so when did you put the meter in? When did the other one fail? When did you, you know... What, what were the time gaps? How long are we estimating water use? You'll get all the information you need, uh, supervisor, to to determine whether or not that meter was replaced in a timely manner. 
So um, you're, you're comfortable with that? I absolutely yeah. Let, let me have from a, from a purely, uh, first of all, um, th there is no question uh, that uh, Marty and uh, his brother Jurgen have been unbelievably supportive of what we've done at the GMA. So my antenna goes up when you guys take the time from your very busy operation to bring an issue before us, so I'm, I'm listening to it. And I'm wondering if, rather than us trying to adopt an ordinance that has some practical, a uh, change in ordinance that has some practical uh, problems in it, uh, maybe we ought to send it back to staff and have you guys work out some language that deals with what Supervisor Bennett just said. And I would look at even going beyond the 10 days if we're going to do that because I could pull my meter out. I don't have a backup meter. I, I, I don't pump that much, and so I can't spread it out over that large of a base. But I could pull that meter out, run it to a repair shop. By the time they do that and send it back to me and get it back in, I may be uh, two weeks or whatever in between an irrigation. I mean, the berries are standing down here in just a few weeks. I have time to do those fixes. So it may be that more than 10 days if we do it by exception. Though That would be an example. The issue of uh, how to make the form reflect or what the reporting requirement is if you do a replacement meter, uh, I think you raise a good issue. We need to be able to reconstruct from a staff standpoint if the question ever comes up, when did the meter fail? What was the meter last reading? When was the re meter replaced? Compare that to the same time frame in previous reporting periods, um, year over year, month over month, and find out same time last year for the same crop, you, you burnt 100 acres, now you're reporting 10 acres. This doesn't make sense, and be able to reconstruct that. That, that could be a game that's played, right? The meter went out a long time ago. I'll write down that I replaced it on I saw it on Monday, I replaced it on Tuesday, I'm good to go, and all of a sudden the usage is off by 90%. This doesn't make sense. So maybe, and I'm throwing this out to staff and to the board, maybe this is one of those items we need to send back to staff and relook at some of this language, and can we live with that? Because you're, you're asking for a number of changes, and I'm not sure this is the forum to be rewriting these changes and call this a second reading. I'm not sure I'm comfortable doing that. Well, that's you know that's uh, obviously up to this board. I, I didn't come here to you know disrupt the apple cart, but by by the way, I mean the staff's been great. So you know if you want to, it's going to take more chefs or than more hours. Um, you know if you want to put more time in it, I'd be happy to volunteer. You know your your brother has 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 written this same similar software for for our company. We basically have code uh, that does pretty much everything you guys do, um, just for our own our own wells and. Um, you know, he and I have actually had this same conversation. I'm, I'm <laughs> you can probably it. imagine. <laughs> so what, uh, let me ask you, what what do you want to do? Or, I mean, Dave, what, what do you want to do? You're, you're a pumper. You you see the problems. The, the, the issues that it seems to raised. me and Marty's comments are, are pretty straightforward. And, and if, if uh, uh, Director Bennett's uh, suggestion of that... Uh, 10-day leeway if you put you in your, put in your own meter. That seems a pretty quick fix we could do right now. Okay. Does it cover all the other issues that? Uh... It seemed like the other issues were already covered by Mr. Bondi already okay. in the markup. Isn't that true? If we make that if we make that uh, one change that one that Steve recommended, have we covered all the issues as you see it? Uh, you know, I think from my from my kind of parochial, selfish perspective, yes. I mean, if I put myself in, in the GMA's shoes, I think you're leaving yourself a little bit open, to tell okay. you the truth. But, um, Mike, what do you want to do? <clears throat> well, I'm thinking uh, in Zone's case, we have some meters that are very difficult to replace, and you, you have to end up repairing them, you know. So uh, we, we need to be flexible so that there are different categories of pumpers. And so to accommodate somebody who can get it done tomorrow, and then we have to also be able to accommodate somebody who is going to need three weeks. So, uh, oh, and then report. Yeah, and yeah. and I think the language you've already got there would do that. Okay, what, what do you want to do? Well, uh, I, I guess my, I, I echo what Charlotte says. If if somebody is, uh, I would assume you guys know better than I, but I would assume if somebody doesn't have backup meters, et cetera, they're also probably 
this isn't happening that often. Somebody like like uh, Marty's operation, he's replacing more often, so he doesn't. So you just like as Charlotte said, you'd report if it took you uh, a longer period of time. What I just don't know is the actual wording of changing the ordinance here. Um, do we have to craft that and then turn to county council? But I'm, I'm usually, unless I have the exact language, I'm, I'm usually saying, hey, direct staff to clean the language up so we don't have any mistakes and just bring it back next next time. So, well, maybe we should do that then. Yeah, yeah. So that way you just don't have any any misunderstanding. Unless, unless there's something about this, but I think this, you know, I want number one, I also want to commend this, this board and staff as before I came on board, just started the process of. You know, looking at all these things so they weren't out of date. So, I would I would just think that's the that's the most prudent thing to do. Okay, Charlotte. Sure. That's fine with me. When we finish our decision on what we're going to do with the ordinance, I still have my original question. Okay. With that, uh, Bob, you want to say something? Good afternoon, Robert Aronio, Crestview Mutual Water Company. Uh, it just came to um, the idea to me. Two possibilities here. One, you have a meter committee which this whole thing was started with, uh, the brains behind it and the ideas on how to form this thing along. If that's insufficient, isn't that why we have the SAG? To deal with these issues and talk these out in order to bring them back to you so you don't have to burn so many cycles of staff, use the horsepower that's behind me here in order to address these problems and come up with the language and, and float it through real world applications as we deal with every day. Okay, all right, Thank very you. good. All right. Um, now, ask your uh, original, original question, question that you wanted to ask. <laughs> uh, yes, you sent our notice, and it was published in the newspaper. Whether we adopt it or not, we'll be adopting something at some time that is putting a new time limit requirement on pumpers. Exactly how are they going to know that there is a new time limit requirement put on them? Um, I defer to Al, but I, a couple things. Um, we can send another postcard. That's an option. Uh, we're required by statute to do another public notice. Uh, other options are to send a flyer. I think we've talked in past meetings about uh, newsletters going out with the semi-annual statement. So I think there's several vehicles okay, for communicating. Let me, let me just say this. If we were to go ahead and adopt this today, then it's effective in 30 days. Is that correct? I believe so. I believe so. Speaking it's, of, it's effective in, in a short while. Uh, and what, if something is published in a newspaper, I really and truly, that, that's fine for letting people know there's an upcoming public hearing. But my guess, and farmers may be different than I am, but my guess is that there are very few more people than me who read those things, and I don't read them. Sure. So to put it out and say we published it and so everybody should know that they've got 10 days to notify us of this isn't isn't good when this comes back to us and if for no other reason i'm going to go to, to delay this when it comes back i would like a plan as to when we're going to send out what type of notification to everybody who has a pump and needs to know this information okay um uh, mike yeah. Well, I was just going to agree totally with uh, Ms. Craven. I, since the uh, foreclosure, uh, I, I haven't got the time to sift through that, the newspaper articles anymore. No, there's more no public notices than yeah. there is paper. That's right. Well, okay. yeah, and the paper financially had to shrink, and so it's just a uh, notice that gets buried. So uh, we go back to you know some of my stuff from last year, N noticing properly of the affected parties is probably a very primary duty that we have and, and if we delay something in order to more properly give everybody a chance to be forewarned I think is a very prudent thing. Okay, let's do this. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm thinking and you guys can yay or nay it. Um, let's bring back to the July meeting a revised language that incorporates some of the things that Marty talked about as best we can. Let's put it on as a specific task item to the SAG group so that they can put real world binoculars on it and, and take a good look at it and determine whether or not this is reasonable and it works. And that gives you some time frame between now and then to come up with your notification strategy. And let's just put that on the July meeting. Okay? Uh, Chair, could I just make a suggestion that since this seems to be a relatively minor wordsmithing issue, calling a meeting of the SAG, 
probably entails a whole lot more expense and staff time than just pulling this together maybe with a with a telephone call with with mr graham cowan okay. well I, I would i would agree with that i think the idea of skag for future things i think the suggestion is more in principle for future okay you know, yeah then let's let's do that there, there there's no sag meeting scheduled between now and then not yet. Okay. All right. Oh, I I was thinking there was. Okay. Then what I want what I want you to do is uh, uh, adjust the language to incorporate what the discussion is. Uh, we do have some original committee members that worked on the well ordinance. Let's run them by them. Send a copy to Tom and Bob and who else was on the committee. Take and okay and and take a look at it. Okay. We'll we'll put them all to work. All right. We'll even send a copy to Sam because Sam has meters. I mean, what more? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's do that. Bring it back for the reading in the July meeting, and um, I think it'll make a better ordinance for us anyway. Okay, everybody, okay with that? And then, as part of the package in July, come up uh, with a notification plan so we can make sure we don't get the problem that we've had in the past. Okay. Yeah. No, I think it's just staff. Uh, it's just staff direction. We don't need a motion on this, do we? No, it's just staff direction. Okay, very good. Let's go to item number uh, backwards now. Item number seven. Good afternoon, Chair Mollard, board members, members of the audience. Gerhard Hubner, Watershed Protection District. Uh, very simply today, in this item uh, before you, you have the opportunity to do election voting for the LAFCO Special District. I'm going to go right to the recommendations. Uh, we did in your board packet include, excuse me, a ballot. So today, uh, if you so choose, you, talk, you have the opportunity to elect two candidates to the Ventura LAFCO uh, to represent Special District for Ventura County for one uh, regular seat and one alternate seat. Uh, there is also the opportunity to vote yes, no on the amendment to the rules and regulations. That's part of the resolution and, and by doing the ballot adopt resolution 2010-5. And thus we will then submit that to LAFCO by the deadline uh, needed. Okay, um, where is the ballot that we... I'll send it by email. Okay, all right, there it is there. Um, all right. Um, 7B, page 4. Did uh, Bruce, did you want to speak to this? Okay, please. I'm Bruce Dandy, a director with the United Water Conservation District, and I am one of the nominees for the alternate special okay. district representative for LAFCO. I just want to thank you for putting this on the, your agenda. Um, I do believe the ballot does need to be returned to LAFCO by this Friday, so I would encourage you to move it quickly. If you're going to cast a ballot, I would ask for your consideration. And uh, it's something that I am looking forward to working with LAFCO on in the future. Um, but uh, thank you for putting it on your agenda. So. Thanks, Thanks for my reason to be here. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Could we take, there are three things we're being asked to, to look at. Can we take them separately, please? Okay. And uh, let's go. I'm flipping pages here. So number one is the. It, there are three little boxes at the bottom of the page. Number one is for the, uh, sp the the member. Number two is the alternate, and number three is an amendment to the rules. Okay. Uh, item number uh, one. Okay. There's the there's members for regular LAFCO spe special districts. We have four names in there. Well, that's two number names. two. Oh, yes. There are two names for number one. Okay, two names for number one. Um, I would nominate uh, Elaine Freeman. Okay, I have a nomination for Elaine Freeman. I'll second that. In a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, saying none. Before we do number two, uh, for the record, um, Bruce is our former president of United. I've had an unbelievable opportunity to work with him over the years and, and likewise, and has done a great job. So I, first of all, I thank you for coming and speaking to us today. And um, um, do we have any other candidates in the alternate category here? All right. Chair, if you don't mind, I'd like to also forward the name of Al Fox, a previous board member on this board. And a pleasure working with him, a clear thinker, and 
a person not afraid to speak up when he thought necessary. So another good candidate, I thought. Okay. Um, all right. So anybody else want to speak on behalf of, uh, of any other individual? I'm open for um, nominations. And oh, Mike. Sorry, Mike Sullivan with United Water. I just want to let you know that at the last Ventura County Special Districts Association, Al Fox withdrew his name as a candidate. Yes. Okay. Hey, thanks for that. <laughs> a very important piece of information. All right. Um, with that, I'll I, I'll go ahead and make a nomination. I'll nominate to Bruce Dandy from United Water as our alternate to uh, Lafco Special District. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing. Hearing none, so move. Let's deal with item number three. I would say yes. This uh, is always an item of contention, uh, especially with the cities. As soon as somebody, uh, for some reason, leaves and there's a vacancy, all the people act as if there is no uh, uh, alternate, and everybody writes letters to all the other cities saying, gosh, I want to be the, the, the new member. I want to be the new member. I think it would solve problems. Why else do you have an alternate Yeah. but to move up? Yeah. I mean, to me, that's... Okay, you want to make a motion? So I'll, I'll move yes. Okay, I'll second that. Uh, any uh, discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none. Okay. Have we solved that problem? All right. Let's go to item number eight. Uh, yeah. uh, the, uh, one other action. Okay. Taking those results and adopting resolution number 2010-5. So move. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Your last action was to immortalize your, your results into the resolution okay. by having the resolution. There's a motion and a second. So moved. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's deal with number eight, please. Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Lennox has been a long-time friend of mine, and I feel uncomfortable saying I would like to recuse myself. Yes. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. And right now we have three members. Um, Supervisor Bennett told me he had to leave. He's checking to see if he can stay so we can deal with this issue and have four members and not just three members. The three members are legal to do it, but to have another mind listening to the issue uh, I think is appropriate. So. While we're waiting for Steve to come back, let's go ahead and deal with the issue. Are you presenting it? Yes, I am. For the record, Rick Vergoots, I'll be presenting the item. Uh, and I haven't had the opportunity to meet Mr. Lennox. Is he here? No. I... No, he's not here. Okay. Al, what uh, do you suggest? Oh, it's a civil penalty appeal, right? And the uh, pellet is not here, or whatever the legal term is. Yeah, um, I, I would construe it as a waiver of his right to a hearing. So, um, on that basis, the uh, and no materials were submitted in support of the appeal, or those are with the staff report. Those are with the staff report. And we know for sure that he was notified. I'm sorry? Uh, we know for sure that he received the notification of the date and time. Yes, I talked with Dave uh, today, and Dave confirmed uh, he did talk. He did receive a written notice, and uh, Dave also spoke with him on the telephone. And, Is that right, Dave? Okay. And, and also under the, the board's procedural rules, um, you could decide not to hear the appeal, and that would end the matter as well. Okay, so we could... Hear the appeal. The, the appellate is, uh, I know, is that the correct term? He's not here. He's not here, and therefore we go with staff, or we just deny hearing the appeal, period. What, what do you want? Without what, Tell us uh, how you want us to handle these appeals so we have a track record of how we've done in the past. You, you decide how you want us to do it. Well, my recommendation in this uh, case would be for the board to simply decide not to hear the appeal. Okay. And we do that as a motion? Yes. Okay. Can I have a motion? We ask if he was in the audience. Does he have a representative here? Before we. 
Is there a representative uh, representing uh, Mr. William Lennox, uh, Bill Lennox, a.k.a. the Lennox Ranch? Okay. Okay, none. Then I will move to not hear the appeal. Okay. Second. Okay. Um, any other discussion? Let's have a roll call on that, please. And the supervisor, Bennett, is absent. That'll be fun. Chair Mulhart? Here, yes. Dir Director Craven? Yes. Director Kelly? Oh, he's abstaining. Oh, I'm sorry. Director Borcher? Yes. Okay. All right. That issues that one. All right. We have a series of administrative uh, items. All right. Move to receive and file. Okay. And a second on that, please. Second. All right. Hearing no objection, it's uh, received and filed. We're going to adjourn to closed session. Uh, Al, out of closed session, are we going to do any reporting out? Uh, to one of the matters, yes. Okay. So we'll recon reconvene out of closed session on uh, one of the items. All right. Anybody else have anything before I go? Hello, hello. Steve. Were you going to mention something about a workshop? Oh, uh, Jeff. Were we going to mention something let me, uh, about a possibility? Uh, it, l let me uh, just pass on. As you know, there has been some discussion going on on credits and what to do with the credits. Um, what we've done is we've come, as I indicated to you before, we've come up with a series of possibilities and probably more questions than answers. And the intent now is to schedule sometime in July a workshop, probably about two hours, so we can have a full discussion of what we've been talking about and what some of the ideas are. And then out of that, it'll be put on the board agenda at the regular board meeting so that the board then has a chance to give some kind of direction to either do something about it or let it die or whatever. So no decisions are made. It's simply a report. We'll do it as a workshop at least one day in July. A workshop for, you said we. I don't know who a we A workshop is. for the board so the board can go to it. will be a noticed workshop for the board and for the public. Okay. okay? It'll be an open forum as we've done workshops in the past. And just to be clear, that that means that we'll be having two meetings in July, the special meeting where we do the workshop and the regular meeting of the board, at least as it was discussed today. If you're, uh, And we don't have a date yet set for okay. those. I will be gone until the 13th, okay. returning the 13th, and I have so shoulder surgery scheduled for the 30th. Okay. It'll be before. So if it could be between those yes, days, it'll be I'd before really the. It, the intent is to do it before the board meeting, uh, to have a, uh, an open air discussion as we've done in other workshops about some of the things we've thought about in the credit issue and determine to give the board some guidance and then use the board forum meeting in July as a way of giving staff direction. Yes or no? Do we have enough time to notice that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're going to come up with a date. Okay, all right, with that, meetings, oh, John, yes. Uh, just real quickly, John Matthews for State Ready Mix and uh, R&R Recycling. I know you're going into closed session on that. I know that Mr. Goldenring will be sticking around to hear the report on that. I assume you'll come back if there's any action. that will take him and make that report in open session. That's right. uh, is that correct? If any action is taken. Uh, if well, we take it. I was, I was actually referring to the other matter on which we would be reporting. I don't anticipate a report uh, out of closed session with regard to that item. You do not? Okay. Okay. Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. Meetings adjourned. Oh, meeting to closed session. I'm sorry. I know. I know.